Today we're going to be learning Sukkah Daf Mem Hey. We are going to start at the very bottom of Mem Dalad Amubet. This is the Daf for Shabbat. Um, we're going to finish up with Lulav and then we're going to move on to Aravai, even though we've already been dealing with it. But now we're going to see the Mishnah where it really goes in depth into the Minak of Aravai. We're going to talk about it and how it developed and different Machlokot about what exactly the mitzvah was. Mitzvah Lulav Ketzad. So remember they said on Shabbat, what do you do? Everybody brings their Lulavim. Um, we saw they bring the lulavim to Arabayit, the chazanim accept them, and then they put them al gabei ha'itztiba. So we talked about that, 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 that those were these benches. So Tani Tana Kameda Rav Nachman, a Tana brought, a, not a Tana, the people who would memorize Brito brought this version of the Mishnah in front of Rav Nachman and said, Sodrin al gag ha'itztiba. We had al gav, which means on top of the, the, the benches. But he says, Sodrim al Gag Ha which means the roof of this area where the Itztaba were. So to which Rav Nachman says to him, Amale, Vechili Abshanu Tzarech, what, you're going to dry them out? And let's imagine putting them on a roof with straight with the sun, it's going to be totally dried out. We all know how bad, how quickly Aravo dry. And La'ema, you should say, Al Gav Ha He corrects him and says, No, 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 it must be on top of the benches. But. Now we're going to see Amar Rechav, Amar Rav Yudah. Ha Rabbi, it's Stav Kafulaya, Stav Lifnimi Stav. If you remember, we've seen this before. There were colonnades, right, like these pillars that went. There were two rows of them. The Itztabaot were in between them, and above them there was a roof, and therefore that was the best place to put them because they were covered from the sun. Okay. Mishnah. Mitzvat Arava Ketzad. How did they do this mitzvah of Arava? And now we're going to have one of these Mishnayot that's similar to the style we had in Yoma, where we talked about that sometimes the Mishnayot describe how things were, not necessarily that it's a halachic Mishnah, where this is telling you it has to be this way, but it described what would happen in the temple. Now, part of the problem here, we already know that there's a bit of a discussion about what exactly happened in the temple. Did they, were they, when they went around, the altar, were they carrying a ravot? Were they carrying the lulav and all the four minim? It's not really clear. Part of the problem seems to be, we also talked about how Hoshanot, that we do nowadays, is reminiscent, reminiscent of this custom. But what must have happened, and the question is, we had a discussion, is arava still, do we still do arava after the temple? And we said, yes, we do, right? And then there was this debate, does it override Shabbat? And only when it's on the seventh day, and then only in Israel, but not anywhere else. And then, oh, well, then they changed it that nowhere, because since not in, out of Israel, then not even in Israel, that it no longer overrides Shabbat, but there is this custom of Arava. Safrai claims in this book, Mishnah Eretz Yisrael, which I quote from sometimes, um, he claims that there must have been a break. And part of the reason why we're not exactly sure what happened in the temple was because there must have been a break where after the destruction, they must not have continued this mitzvah of Arava, because remember, in the time of the temple, there was no custom outside the temple, and only later did they kind of reinstitute it in some way, right? That was what we had, Halach HaLamosh Misinai versus Yisod Nevi'im or Minhag Nevi'im, right? Whereas Halach HaLamosh Misinai was in the temple, the Yisod Nevi'im and the Minhag Nevi'im was after the destruction. And then the question is, exactly how did they do it? Okay, so... There seems to be because there was a bit of a break, there was a bit of a lack of clarity about exactly what happened in the temple, even though we're going to see that they described the mitzvah, but we're going to see that there's even other things that were a little bit under debate. So, mitzvah arava ketzad, makom ayalamata mi So, how did they do it? Well, there was a place south of Jerusalem, v'nikam Moza. it's called Moza, right? There's a city today called Moza. I assume it's the same. Yordim l'sham u'malatim isham morbiyot shal arava. They would go there and collect big, tall arava branches. Okay, it seems like maybe there they had tall ones because you need really tall ones. We're going to see why. And then they would put them around the altar. Now we see why they had to be tall because the tops of them would jut out above the altar. We're going to get into all the, the numbers and how exactly, how tall and how... You know, what the heights had to be. We'll get into that in the Gemara. Remember, the altar, the big altar, the main one they used for sacrifices, was very tall. Tak'u v'hariu v'tak'u. When they did this ceremony, they blew on the shofar. They did a tkia, a trua, and a tkia. B'chol yom mekipim et ha'mezbeach pa'am achat, v'omrim, ana Hashem moshiana, ana Hashem atzlichana. Every day they would encircle them, the altar, 
one time. We had a whole debate who encircles the altar. We said the Ba'alei Mumim do it. Remember, Rish Lakish says, even blemished Kohanim can do it. And Rabbi Yochanan said, no, only real Ko, you know, um, Kohanim were not blemished, unblemished. And then we said there was a debate among the Rishonim whether if, according to Rish Lakish, blemished Kohanim could do it, does that also mean all Yisraelim can do it and we're part of the mitzvah? So Safra also says, interesting, he says, think about it. If it were only Kohanim, then it's part of the Avodat HaMikdash, the temple worship. If we allow non, let's say, blemish Kohanim, or you know, blemish Kohanim could still be in the realm of the Avodat HaMikdash, temple worship. But if we say that regular Yisraelim, non Kohanim, can come in and do it, then it's part of the experience of Aliyah LaRega. Now, if you remember, he says it very well. On, on Sukkot, so on um, Pesach, I mean, everyone came and was involved in the Korban Pesach. In fact, people came in and they slaughtered the animals. In on Yom Kippur, people came and watched the Kohen Gadol. And remember, they would wait for him to come out. And they bowed when he said, right, the Shema Meforash, the, the holy name of God. They bowed down. Right on, on these other holidays, there was, a, there was a, um, a partaking of the people in the mitzvah. So here, maybe this was their way of partaking in the temple, what was going on in the temple, as they came on Aliyah Larego. Besides that, they would bring sacrifices, but that's not the same as having some ceremony that they're involved in. So now, every day they would circle at one time, again, not clear who, and they would say the following words, Ana Hashem Oshiana, Ana Hashem Atzlichana. Please God, save us, right? Bring us, right? Make us successful. Um, or, you know, Save us from salvation, you know, ever all that. Now, this is from Hallel. We know this from Hallel. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Ani Vehu Hoshiana. He says, Me and him save us. What does this mean? Where does this come from? Right? It's not a verse. So, there's three different opinions about what this is from. If you have a shot and scene, they have a whole chart that describes Rosh's interpretation, which is these are Ani and Hu. By the way, Hu, if you're listening, Hu is without an Aleph. Normally, Hu is Hevav Aleph. Right? This is Ani Vihu without the Aleph. So Rashi explains that the that first of all, Ana Hashem in Gematria is 72. If you use the Shema Meforash, of, I'm sorry, 78, using the special name of God, right? Yud Hei Vav, Yud Hei Vav Hei. The uh, um, Ani Vihu is also 78. So it's the same in Gematria, he says. If you look at the third line in Rashi, Ani Vihu, but Gematria, Ana Hashem, is the same as Ani Vihu. Ve'od mishivim v'shtayim shemoten. God had, the Shema Meforash of God, according to some, has 72, right? The real full Shema Meforash is made up of 72 words, each three letters. Where do we get them from? This is the chart in the Schattenstein. There's three verses in Parsha B'Shalach, in Shmot, chapter, let me just check again, chapter 14, I think it is. Second, sorry. Find it. Chapter 14, verses 19 to 21. Okay, the Psukim are the Yisam Malach Elohim Aleph Lefnei Machanei Yisrael. The Malach who was going. This is right before the splitting of the sea. Goes went before the people. Ve'elach Mecholehem, and he went out behind them. Also, the Yisam Mudanam Ipnehem Ve'amom Mecholehem. The cloud of God went before and after. You can see why these would be the words. The psukim from which they're going to derive the Shema Mephoash, the special name of God, because we're about to have this major revelation of God at Yam Suf, at the Red Sea. Right, it went in between the Egyptians and the Jews, etc. Right, and then um, he lit up the night. They didn't get near each other all night. Moshe picks up his hand on the water. Hashem, here's the Shema Mephoash, the UK Vavke. And he makes the land dry and the water splits. So it's describing the splitting of the waters. If you take those three verses, okay, now here's the chart in the shot and scene if you have it. You write out the first verse in order, the second verse in reverse order, starting from the hay of Halayla, the last hay, going all the letters in reverse. And the third passage you put in regular order. And then you cut first letter, of each pasuk, the way, again, it's really the last letter of the second pasuk. But if you match up, you get vahu is the first, vayat, right, vayisa, 
then Halayla, the hey from the last hey, and Vayet Moshe. So Ani Vehu. So you have Vehu over there. Ani is the thirty seventh, and all those formations, all those three letter formations that you make from the second one of each and the third one and all that, those are all part of the seventy two special name of God. And Ani Vehu is first and thirty seventh, and that's what we say Ani Vehu, which is a reference to the Shema Mifolash of God. Okay, that's Rashi. That we're basically invoking God's special name. The second option is to say, no, Ani Vehu means I and God, please save us. Now, what are you asking God to save God? Well, the point is that God comes with us into Galut, like when we go to exile, and God is with us in our pain. God is with us in our pain moments, and therefore we're asking for salvation for us and for God, because when he saves us, he'll also be saved from you know, from the, the bad. Third option is Ani Vehu is referring to the altar. They're circling the altar, and they're basically saying a blessing for us, and a blessing for the safety of the altar. So those are three different ways of understanding that line of Rabbi Yehuda. But on the last day of the holiday, and the Gemara is going to later reference Jericho, the battle of Jericho, and they blew the shofar also. It's interesting because they blew the shofar here also. And they blew the shofar, and then the seventh day, right, they surrounded the city seven times, and then the walls fell. So this is reference to there, possibly, that we're kind of invoking other times that God saved us in the city of, in the, in, the, um, in Israel, and that maybe that's what we're trying to invoke when we do this. Okay. Just so you know, the next few, the next sentence, next two sentences, don't appear in the original version of the Mishnah in what's called Ketav Yad Kaufman. It doesn't appear there. Um, and it seems that this was added based on the Tosefta. This appears in the Tosefta. So it's not in the original Mishnah. But in any case, we'll read it because it's here. Bish'at p'tirata ma'im omrim. When they leave, what do they say? There's a debate whether it means whether they leave on day number seven at the very end, or is it when they leave every day from the temple when they finish? Yofi lach mizbech, yofi lach mizbech. Oh, you beautiful mizbech, you beautiful mizbech. Okay, it's a little bit strange. We have a prayer for the mizbech, just like before. Ani v'ho was, v'hu was possibly also for the mizbech. So it's, again, it's a little bit strange. But... Anyway, possibility, right? That's one version that we're basically praising the Mizbech. How beautiful is the Mizbech? Also, we just decorated it, right? It's a way of saying the beautiful altar. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, and normally Rabbi Eliezer is Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus, but in this case, the Tosefta has it as Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, which is the one who appears often in telling us all sorts of things about the temple. If you remember, the last time we talked all about the temple, we had a bunch of things that Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov said about what happened in the temple, much less typical for Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus. Liyahu lecha mizbech, liyahu lecha mizbech, for you, God, and for the altar. It's like a prayer for God and a prayer for the altar. We'll see in the Gemara. The Gemara is going to question this a little bit. But there's a bit of a problem with that, but we'll get back to that. The same way we do it on a weekday. That's the way we do it on Shabbat. Again, this is only on day number seven. Remember, we do it on Shabbat. Elisha, there's one minor difference. It seems that on a regular day, we would cut it that day. But, because they dry up very quickly, we know with our Ravod. But on Shabbat, they would do it from before Shabbat. They would use these big, wide vessels to put them into um, that were made of gold. So that, right, which they would then put water in them so that they won't dry out for the next day. Rabbi Yochanan ben Brokash seemed to have a different version of how we did this mitzvah. They wouldn't bring aravot. They would bring stalks of a palm tree, which is more reminiscent of lulav instead of arava. And they would, again, how do you understand chovtim? We saw this before, either shake them or, or hit them. They would hit them on the ground next to the altar. Some people say the word, right there, again, the earlier versions of the Mishnah don't have the word bakarka. Which maybe means they would place them in the ground next to the altar, which makes more sense in terms of what we were talking about. And that day they would call it chibut charayot, because that's what they would do. They would be chovet the, the, the charayot of dekel. Some people say this means only day number seven. Some people say this is actually referring to all seven days. And that every day was called Chivut Chagayot. Um, uh, one second, what did I want to add about this? Ah, 
So I want to point out what would be the difference between using palm and using the aravot. The aravot, it makes a lot of sense that they're using this, or even if we just talk about the mitzvah of arava and the significance, because the aravas, arve nachal, it grows by the water, and the water is always the theme of Sukkot. We have the Nisuchamayim and all that because we're about to ask for rain. It's right before the rainy season, and that's what we're really praying for on that day. So that's also um, important. Oh, but in speaking of the Aravot, I looked up the five Aravot, why we take five. So again, it was true that it's based on the Ari, which the Mishaburah quotes, but the Shulchan Aruch says one. One is sufficient, okay, which is very interesting. He even says one with even one leaf, to which the Ramah says, no, it's really not nice to do the mitzvah that way. We have to beautify the mitzvah. It should be a better one, but really, minimally, you really only need one. However, based on the Ari, as I told you before, we have five, and we also hit it five times, rather than our Gemara talked about hitting it twice, if you assume chivut is to hit, right? The Arizal, it was his minag to hit it five times on the ground, that's why we hit it five times on the ground. So again, at some point between the time of the destruction and later, this custom developed that we take the lulav and every day in circle, right? With the Sefer Torah, we go around the, the, um, the shul, right? Or the bima or um, whatever it might be, and... On the seventh day, we do it seven times, and then we put down the lulav, we pick up the arava, and then we hit it five times. Much of that is described more by Kabbalistic sources. Um, however, and, and Hoshana Rabbah became this day, also based on the Zohar and other Kabbalistic sources, that it's kind of the end of the Yom Hadin, and it's kind of the finishing of this whole, right, the Yamim Noraim, and it has almost an element of Yom Kippur Rosh Hashanah to it. But that's all a much later edition. This doesn't talk about that really at all. Um, okay, so again, there's some, right, there's some link to what happened there, and then there's additions of Kabbalistic sources that influenced what we are, our practice nowadays. Um, okay, and it's not clear when exactly this custom of Hoshanot started. Um, but you see clearly here from the time of the Amoraim, they were already discussing that there were different things, that they would take the Arava, Chovet Arava, they would make a bracha, remember we saw that in yesterday's stuff. Now the Gemara, the last line of the Mishnah, which is a funny line because it can be read. This is a good example of punctuation and how important punctuation is or lack of punctuation, how it could lead to different interpretations. It's even hard to read this without going by one or the other interpretation, so I'll read it two ways. Miyad, immediately, as soon as this whole thing was finished, the last day, the Tinokot would throw their lulavim to the side of ochlim et rogehem and eat their et rogim. Why specifically the tanim and not the gedolim? It's not clear. This doesn't really seem to be a halachic thing. This seems to be describing what had happened in the temple. Some people say it's miyad tinokot, from the hands of tinokot, shom timot lulavim, the older people grab the lulavim from the tinokot and ochlim et rogehem and eat their et rogim, meaning the older ones take stuff from the younger ones and Again, take their lulavim and eat their etrogim. Again, it's a bit unclear what's going on here. We'll get to this in the Gemara and try to figure it out. Not in today's stuff. Okay, the Gemara starts off with the beginning. They went to the city of Moza. So now they say, Tana mekom kalanya hava. This place we call kalanya. They called it Moza. We call it kalanya, which sounds like colony. It's like a colony. Vitana didam maitama kare le Moza. Why they call it Moza then in our Mishnah? I did Motza because they were excluded from the taxes of the king. They didn't have to pay taxes. They were called Motza, like they're separated out. They're they're exempt from the taxes, and that's why. Which also fits with colony, right? Colonies are like a new thing that don't they don't necessarily pay taxes. Uba'im zukfin otam betzidam is bech. So Tana, here's another bright tip about this. We're going to talk about the height. Rabot va'arukot ugvohot achadasarama. They were many and long, and they were 10 amo, uh, 11 amo tall. Why? So that they'll jut out one ama above the altar. So Amr, we have to understand the, the math here exactly. So Amr, because the Mizbeach was t- nine amo high, so it should only be 10 if it really needed to jut out one ama. So let's see. Amr Mimemar Mishumar Sutra. Shmamina, we can infer from here, al yisod manachut. They didn't put it on the ground. They put it on top of the yisod, which was, right, that piece that jutted out on two sides of the altar, one ama length and one ama of height. So now, not length, I'm width. It was one ama wide, one ama tall, 
and then it went the whole length of the altar on two sides. So now why? Because if it was on the ground, now what we have to realize is the Mizbeach went in a little bit, and then went in a little bit again, and then went straight up. Okay, so now we're going to see all that. And therefore, the Aravot, we're going to assume, now even though it's on an angle, and it's really the hypotenuse of kind of a triangle, but we're going to see that the way they measure it is as if the Aravot go in exactly as the altar does, because the assumption is that when it juts out, it doesn't, doesn't just go straight and tall on the altar, but it kind of leaned over by the, it got all the way to the altar without these, right, where it, it kind of went in a little bit. So let's read. If you say it was really on the ground, the yisod, the base goes up an ama and in an ama. So that's already two amot. Allah chamesh, it goes up another five, right, to the height of six. Vikines ama zeu sovev. So you had the two of the ama, of the yisod. Then it goes up another five, that's seven. Then it goes in another ama, that's eight. Then Allah shalosh vizeu makama kanot. So now it goes up another three, you get to 11, right? That's where the kranot are. You're now at the height of the corners of the altar. So that, right? Gochot al How could you have it then if, if you were going to get to the top of the mizbeach, you're only at 11 here. So if you have ones that are 11, you're only getting up to the top of the altar. How do we have that it went over the altar, that it was higher? You don't have it. Therefore, it must be it was on the yisod. And then we basically subtract the one amma of the height of the yisod. It still has to go in one, and then up five, then in one, up three, and then one above. And that's how you get to that they must have been 11, and it must have been standing on the yisod. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Shema mina. Where do we get this from a verse that this is what you do, that you surround the altar with the aravot? Because it says, Isru chag ba'avotim ard karnot ha'mizbeach. So Rabbi Yavahu says we get it from this pasuk, which we say in halal also. Isru chag bound the holiday with avotim ard karnot ha'mizbeach, which basically sounds right, put trees around it, surround it. Isru from the, from the language of surround it with these leaves. Okay, that's the first interpretation. But now, Amar Rabbi Yavau, Amar Rabbi Elazar, now he darshans in the name of Rabbi Elazar, the Pasuk differently. Some people say it's because in the destru- before the destruction, it was talking about what they did in the temple. After the destruction, we want this Pasuk also to have meaning. And therefore he says, Isru Chag is referring to bind the holiday. What, what do we bind? The Lulav. So if you take the Lulav with its binding, Be'avotim is a reference to Anaf Etzafot, which is the myrtle branch, the Hadas. So if you take the Lulav with its binding and the Hadas with its intertwined branches, then it's as if Banam Izbech. When it says Ad Karnot Izbech, it's saying it's as if you built an altar and sacrificed Korbanot. This, by the way, connects again between the Lulav and worship in the temple. Shene'emar, Isru Chag Ba'avotim Ad Karnot Izbech, as it says in the verse. Third way to darshan this. And, and remember, Rabbi Yirmiya says in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, because after this, we're going to have a number of statements of Rabbi Yirmiya saying things in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that are seemingly unconnected, but they're connected because it's also statements that he made in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And not only did he say it, but Rabbi Yochanan Mishum Rabbi Shimon HaMechozi, Mishum Rabbi Yochanan HaMakoti, Okay, Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon the Machozi, who said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan the Machoti, a different Rabbi Yochanan. Another thing that makes it is if you built an altar and offered sacrifices, if you, now here, Lashon Isru is to add. If you add on another day of the holiday, and that's what we call today Isru Chag, right? In Israel, they have vacation on Isru Chag, there's no school. It's considered a holiday where you're supposed to eat and drink and have festivities. So, right, many people are not so careful about this other than the Misrat Chinuch who decided, right, the education ministry that we're going to make this a day off. But it's basically a special day. And it's if you celebrate it properly, it's as if you built an altar and sacrificed a korban, shneemal, as it says, isru chag ba'avotim ar karnon mizbech. If you celebrate the holiday with avotim, is to thicken things, like by having more food, etc., then 
right? It would be as if you built a sacrifice, uh, an altar and offered sacrifices. Okay, as I said before, we're now going to go into all these statements that Rabbi Yirmiya said in the name of Rabbi Shemar Yochai, but actually they're going to be Chizkiah said it in the name of Rabbi Yirmiya, in the name of Rabbi Shemar Yochai. Amar Chizkiah Amar Rabbi Yirmiya Mishum Rabbi Shemar Yochai. Kol HaMetzvot Kulan Ein Adam Yotzei Behem El Aderach Gedei Latan. You only fulfill mitzvot if you do them in the way that they grow. Where do we get this from? Shanei Amar Atzei Shitim Omdim. They built the walls of the Mishkan in with wood. Omdim, standing. What does it mean? Standing, standing is the way they grew. And from here we learn, by Lulav also, we talked about this before with the blessing, that's why we first have it upside down, and then after the blessing we flip it up, right side up, so that we fulfill the mitzvah only then, when it's derech de latam, the way they grow. Tanya nami hachi, is a bright to support that, and with this bright we're going to see a number of different interpretations of atzei shitim omdim. Atzei shitim omdim, right, this is special shitim wood that they used to build the walls of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. She'omdim g'derek g'delatan, that they're standing the way they grew. Davar acher, a separate, a second interpretation. Omdim she'ma'amidim et sipuyam, that they hold together their covering. There was a gold covering above it, and normally you would just coat it in gold, you put gold around it. But here they say it's ma'amidim. One interpretation is to say they put nails in to make sure it stayed attached. Some people say that they that they it was a miracle that they never rotted, they never got worms inside them, and they were able to always keep the the gold around it because they didn't rot on the inside. Tabachel omdim. What does it mean omdim? They're standing. Notice it's in present tense. Shematomaravad sivaram ubatel sukuyam. Right after the destruction of the tabernacle, you might say, Oh, there's no hope anymore. These stand forever. They will always be there, meaning there's this hope for the future. Another statement. I have enough merits that I could actually, I have the power to basically exempt everyone from judgment. I can basically pass you all on your tests. From judgment, from the day that I was born until today. In other words, anyone who was born from the day that I was born until now, I have the I, I have enough merits. I can do that. What's unique about him? And we're going to see. I'll, I'll actually go on and then we'll go back. Vil male, it should be Elazar beni imi. And if my uh, my son Elazar wasn't with me, miyom shenivra olam ba'ad achshav. Sorry, if my son Elazar were with me, I didn't read that well. Miyom shenivra olam ba'ad achshav. I could do it from today, from the time the world was created until today. Right? Me by myself, I could save everyone from the time I was born till now. If I have my son Elazar with me, the two of us together have the power to save people from what the world was created till today. And if we had the king of Ju- Ju- of the of Yehuda, whose name was he was one of the kings from the Judean dynasty, the son of Uziah was with us. We could save people from the beginning of time till the end of time. And what was unique about these three people? So Yotam was known because Uziah's father got leprosy and then he took over as king, but he didn't call himself king as long as his father was alive. So because of that, and because there was nothing else bad mentioned about him ever, like he was a good king, he went the way of God. If you remember from the book of Kings, everybody kind of had some issue. He had none. He was great. So because of that, he gets, um, he's specially meritorious. And some people say that these people did not get their reward in this world. Remember, Rabbi Shimra Yochai and his son Elazar, they suffered. They were in a, in a cave for 13 years. Because they didn't get rewarded in this world, they basically, he's saying, I have the merits to help people um, to be saved. I saw that there's these great people in the world, but there's not a lot of them. Im elafem, if there are a thousand of them, ani ubanai mehen. Me and my son are with them. Bani mehem, sorry. Me and my son. Im mehem, ani ubani mehen. If there's only a hundred, me and my son are still with them. Im shnaim hem, if there's only two special people in the world, Rashi even adds here, and it's based on the Gemara later, who are zochet to see the shechina, to basically see God's presence, ani ubani hen. It's me and my son. Okay, now this sounds very arrogant, but the commentaries all try to kind of justify this and say it's not that he's saying this himself it's that you know god told him when he was in the cave and that he was on this special 
he was in a special place in the world. He wasn't like everybody else. And he knew it and, and everyone else knew it and it wasn't really arrogant to say this. So the Gemara starts asking, Umi zutrei kulei hai, are there really so few? Rava, didn't Rava say, Tim alfei dare hava? There were 18,000 generations, Dekame kud shaburichu, that are, right, I'm trying to think one second. Suivi, shmona, one second, I want to check one interpretation. There were... 18,000 Darehim. just want to check. Oh, sorry. I knew it wasn't generations. Dare is rows. There were 18,000 rows of tzaddikim that were sitting before God. Shneemar, saviv shmona asre elef. Okay, there's a pasuk that says around God there were 18,000. So here you see there's way more than Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said. So lo kasha ha de mistakle ba'aspaklaria ha-meira ha de lo mistakle ba'aspaklaria ha-meira there's people who see God through a clear, um, right, who, who see God through a very clear, like a translucent um, mirror almost or, or window, okay, where they can see God right through there and they can see clearly, okay, or maybe even transparent would be the right word, through a transparent screen. And that's the unique people, whereas everybody else sees God through a more, right, maybe translucent or even more opaque kind of screen where they can't really see God so much. Okay? So that's the that's the difference. You might be asking, wait a minute, wasn't it only Moshe Rabbeinu who saw God through Aspaklari and Meira? Right? Not not these people, right? He's known. That's what makes Moshe different from all the other prophets. So some people say, oh, difference between prophets and Talmudei Chachamim. There's prophets. There's one track of prophets. Moshe was the only one. And there's a different track of Talmudei Chachamim. And that's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son. And maybe some others, if there's a hundred, if there's a thousand. But, you know, maybe there's only two. Some people say, no, no, no. Moshe was able to do this when his lifetime. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son could only do this after their death. They were able to see God, but not during their lifetime. Now the Gemara says, the Mestachle v'aspaklari ha-meira, mizutrei kulehai, or there's so few. There's no less, and here's the famous, these 33 tzaddikim, we call them the Lamed Vavnikim that live in the world. Notice the source says there's no less than 33, meaning there's at least 33, I'm sorry, 36. There's at least 36, okay? In other words, we're saying, how could you say it's possibly only Rabbi Shem Baruchai and his son, right? There's at least 36 tzaddikim. That are known to greet the presence of God on a daily basis. How do we know this? Because it says, Happy are the people who wait for God. Those who wait for God are called the Lamed Vav. Right, this Pasuk is referring to them. Lo is Lamed Vav. This is 36. So it sounds like there's at least 36. Lo Kashya. Hai da Aile Bebal. Hai da Aile Belo Bal. These go in with Baal, and those go in without Baal. What is Baal? What are we talking about? So Rashi says, Baal is Rishut. If you remember when Esther wants to go to Ahasuerus, she has to ask for permission. She can't just go in and see the king whenever she wants. So these people, the 36, can go see God every day, but only with permission. Whereas Rosh Hashem, Rabbi and Rabbi Lazar, son, they can go in even without, being, without permission. They can just walk in, see God. Some people say that, no, Bibar means with his son. Bar, Bar Mitzvah, Ben Mitzvah. Bar means son, or so-and-so, Bar so-and-so. So it means these, right, only Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai went in with his son. That was a special schut that he and his son were both able to go in rather than these others who were individuals without their sons. Okay, next, Bishat Ptiratan Ma'in Omrim. So what do they do, right? But before we move on, I can just say, you know, I didn't have time to really give it enough thought, but you could try to connect between all these different statements of number one saying, add to the holiday was the first thing you said, right? And then it's as if you built a mizbah and sacrificed it. Then he said, all the mitzvot, you only fulfill the way that they grow. Then he said, me and my son can basically, and, and Yotam also, we can, we can basically save everybody from judgment. And then he said about himself being compared to these others, that they're in a different place than everybody else. What to make of the connection between these, I leave it for you for, for some thinking. Next, Bishat Ptiratam Ayim Obrim. This was that line that was only in the Tosefta, not in the Mishnah. If you say, uh, what is it? Right? To God and to the altar. You're 
connecting God with some other something. Vitanya, and the Brighta says, You can't do that. It sounds like you're praying to two gods. It sounds like you're looking at the Mizbeach as if it's God. It says only to God himself. So, this is what it really means. We thank you, God. And we praise the Mizbeach. To you we thank, and to you we praise. Kilus is just a different word of praise. It's basically what we say twice, saying we're going to praise you in different ways, but the point is, God, we're thanking, and the Mizbeach, we're praising. We said, but really we want to deal with Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca, who said that we use a lulav. Why do we use a lulav and not our avot? Or how do we know that we use a lulav on that there's a mitzvah of lulav on the altar also, according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca. So Amar Rav Huna, my time is Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca. What's his reason? Dechtiv kapot shnayim echad lulav echad lezbeach. Just like we had our vein nachal, plural. Also kapot marim is plural. What's a plural? It's not to take two lulavim. Must be coming to teach us two mitzvot: one for lulav, one for mezbeach. The Rabbanan Amrei. So how do they respond to him? Oh, kapot ktiv. Remember, it only says it once. It says it. It says kapot, plural, but it's written without the vav, which could be read as kapat, which is singular. So therefore, no, there aren't two mitzvot. You don't take the lulav on the altar. Rabbi Levi Omel, Kitamal, why do we use specifically the lulav? Because it's like a date. Matamal ze ein lo ela since, right, it's a date tree. So since the dates only have one heart, af Yisrael, right, that's the, the hearts of palm, right, from the palm tree, it has one heart. Af Yisrael ein lehem ela le vachad la vihen so it's a, it's a, it's like a, um, a metaphor for the Jewish people that have one heart to God, right? We believe in one God and our hearts are fully toward that one God. Okay, we're now starting a new topic about the blessings on sukkah and lulav. Do, we're going to get tomorrow into the famous bracha, uh, the famous su- subject of Shechianu on sukkah and lulav and other things about do you do it when you build a sukkah, build, a, make a lulav, etc. Um, we'll get to that all tomorrow. But starting with how many days do you make a bracha on sukkah and on lulav, right? We make a bracha on lulav every day and on sukkah every time we go and eat a new meal, okay? But we're going to see that there's actually a debate about this. Another good example of things that we take for granted are not necessarily so clear cut. According to Rav Yehuda, in the name of Shmuel, we take the lulav, we make a bracha all seven days. And on sukkah, we make a bracha only one day. Obviously, we sit in the sukkah all seven days, but we only make a bracha one day. My time, huh? what's the reason? Lulav de mifzake leilot miyamim. Since you don't do lulav at night. So each day is like a new mitzvah. So therefore, you have to make a bracha. Kol yoma mitzvah ba'ape nafshehu. Each day is its own separate mitzvah. But sukkah de lo mifzake leilot miyamim. Kulu shiva kechad yoma arich adamu. Since it's a mitzvah straight for all seven days, day and night. Therefore, it's basically one mitzvah that you're continuing all seven days. It's actually logical to think about, right? Why should you make a bracha every time you go on the sukkah, right? Now, we don't make it every time we go on the sukkah, and if we're still in the middle of a meal, we don't make it again. But if we finished our meal and go inside, and we may take a break, and we're not planning to go back to the sukkah till later, and then we go back in again and eat again, then we make a new bracha. So it does actually seem a little strange. Maybe you would think maybe once a day, or again, if we view this as you're just continually and we, we know also you don't make a bracha on sleeping. That's all separate issue. But it's kind of viewed as one continuum, then maybe you shouldn't make a bracha each time. So Rabbi Barachan Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Sukkah Shivav Lulav Yom Echad. He says the actual reverse in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, right? This is Babylonia versus Israel. Rabbi Yochanan's in Israel. He says, Sukkah, you make a bracha every seven days. Lulav, only one day. Why my taima? Sukkah do oraita shiva. Lulav de Rabbanan, sagele b'chad yoma. Sukkah is a Torah law, seven days. Lulav remembers only one day. Remember, Zechel the Mikdash, we said seven days, but according to the Torah, only the first day. So, only the first day you make a blessing. You don't make a blessing on all the other days because it's only Durabana. Now, how far do you take this? Does this mean any mitzvah Durabana you don't make a mitzvah on? And the Ritva actually says that. It's very interesting because what does he do with Megillah and Hanukkah and those things where we do say, Asher Kedisham and Sabbat Sivan, who God commanded us, even though he didn't really command us directly. We talked about this the other day. But according to this, it sounds like you wouldn't say a bracha on a derabanan. 
Or is he just saying, well, since we met on the first day, so the rest are just a continuation of that first day, there are less, right? It's only Durabanan, so we don't make a separate blessing on them. We kind of, the first day blessing counts for those as well. Um, okay, next. That's two opinions. Neither of them matches what we do today. Ki ata ravin, but when Ravin came, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, he said something different from Rabbi Barbachan in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Echad zevi echad zeshiva. Both sukkah and lulav you take for seven days. You make a bracha for seven days. Right? Everyone agrees you do the mitzvah at all seven days. The question is just you make a blessing. He says both. And Amar Rabbi Yosef, nikote Rabbi Barbachan abiyadach. Take what Rabbi Barbachan says. Why? Be dekulo emora ay kaima kavate besukkah. Seems like he's saying only as regards sukkah. That you shouldn't take what Shmuel says. You should take what Rabbi Yochanan says because everybody says agrees that that's what Rabbi Yochanan said, right? Both Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi. And some people actually have a gear so that Rabbi Dimi also said that. And therefore, with sukkah, you should definitely make a bracha every all the days, and also sometimes, as we said before, multiple times a day. Whereas, um, right, even Tosfa points that out that you know it could be even ten times a day. Each time you do it, right? And he talks about the difference between different mitzvot, how sometimes you make a bracha once and sometimes you make it multiple times a day. Anyway, that's a, a short toast for what you can glance at. Echad zevi, echad ze shiva. Okay, what we're going to get to tomorrow, we're going to start questioning this based on some other sources. And from there, we're going to get to Shechianu, which is an interesting topic in and of itself. With that, I wish you all a Shavuot Tov or Shabbat Shalom, and we will meet up on Sunday. As I said before, we're back to Zoom on Sunday, so anyone who wants to join the Zoom, you're welcome to join the Zoom on a daily basis, Monday through uh, Sunday through Friday.